Um, Rick, thank you. That was really a superb summary of uh, uh, some uh, very careful, meticulously implemented studies. Uh, so uh, the floor is now open uh, for discussion. I, I want to ask you to to expand a little on on your final point. I, it, it is worth remembering that all of these effects are modest. And uh, so what should the next arena be for, for clinical trials in this area? And uh, is there ways, we, we have, ten, we have approached uh, the manipulative therapies and acupuncture and lumped them as sort of mind-body interventions. But uh, are there ways in which we can learn how a practitioner may uh, motivate uh, a more participatory role of the patient, perhaps in both mental processes about pain and in physical exercise. Yeah, motivating patients for uh, lifestyle changes, yeah. like exercise, uh, is an ongoing challenge, I think. Uh, no question about that. Uh, I'm reminded of a cartoon with a patient who is talking with his doctor, and his doctor says, for your back pain, the best thing is exercise. And the patient asks, oh, isn't there anything better, anything else, experimental surgery even, uh, anything but exercise? Um, uh, so it's, it's hard, I think. On the other hand, I, I guess, where do you go from here? It seems to me that there's at least some budding evidence that things like exercise and cognitive behavioral therapy may actually affect uh, central nervous system processing of pain signals. Mm -hmm. uh, and while we talk about a mind-body connection, I'm beginning to think there may actually be a body-mind connection as well, that, that what we do with our bodies may actually affect the, the perception of pain in the central nervous system. Uh, the, the whole concept of neuroplasticity suggests that, that maybe we can remodel or re-educate uh, the CNS to respond differently uh, to... Uh, uh, pain signals, and and that I think does require some active intervention or active participation by the patients as opposed to lying on a table and having something done to them. Uh, and I guess one question would be, are there ways that, that these types of uh, CAM therapies could be integrated with, with efforts to provide that sort of more, uh, we hope, long-term benefit from exercise and cognitive behavioral therapy uh, and again, I think motivating patients into these lifestyle changes is going to be the real challenge. Uh, even exercise is hard. Cognitive behavioral therapy is something people may resist because they think you believe they're crazy if you want to undertake uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Questions for Dr. Dale? Thank you for your outstanding talk. My name is Naresh and I work at NIDA. And I do the community service, repairing the back, lower back pain or knee pain or shoulder pain or anything. I just want a one minute to give a word testimonial from one person. This was 81-year-old man, Jerry. He met me at LA Fitness. And he was saying that, Naresh, I'm having this radiating pain from my neck to my head. What can you, it's driving me crazy. What can you suggest? I told him, Jerry, you have tried water therapy before for knee, hip, and back, and you fixed them. You're sitting in the jacuzzi, go in jacuzzi, in the, take your neck down, and rotate it left and right, up and down, and do the same thing one minute here, one minute in the pool, alternating it. So heating, cooling, and motion, he did it for 10 days. And 10th day, he come and tell me, Naresh, thank you. I... I'm not taking any opiate or any other medications. I have canceled my neurologist appointment. I said, Jerry, I'm so happy for you, but I'm sorry for your neurologist. This is one of the examples. So I have healed another dermatologist with the back pain and knee pain, and he's postponing his surgery for seven, eight years. So there are many, many hundreds of examples like that, maybe along with these three things you mentioned, Aquatic therapy should be explored to help millions of people of this great nation. And for less than a dollar a day, most people can afford joining a health club where side by there is jacuzzi and pool. And I'm not advocating any membership for any one particular group. <laughs> I work for NIH. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks. I think those are pretty interesting observations. And of course, you have to wonder in the absence of control groups well, about all these the factors that, that can lead patients to improve, even in the absence of specific therapy. But uh, but but uh, something that may have affect muscle tension, may affect muscle strength, movement, uh, all those things may be important. So you uh, talked about a tendency for people to seek care when the pain is at its worst. Uh, and I suspect a lot of people do that, but if you ask the chiropractors, acupuncturists, and so on, that's not what they want you to do. What they're thinking is in terms of prevention, ongoing wellness, what they want you to do is... Uh, sort of the same thing you want as a primary care provider is to come in for an acupuncture checkup every now and then. And then if you develop a problem, then maybe increase the frequency of visits. That's something that's very difficult to assess experimentally. Can you tell us about any data that you're aware of in that regard? Or do you think, uh, is there any way that we can look at that type of utilization? Yeah, that's interesting. You're really talking about rather than sort of a one-time intervention as we've tested here, I say one time, 10 weeks uh, of therapy, but not ongoing therapy. Uh, you're asking what, what would happen if these things were continued indefinitely uh, with some regular uh, intervention over time. And I don't think we know the answer to that. I'm not sure. I'm familiar with uh, randomized trials that have looked at r truly uh, extended therapy of that sort. And uh, it strikes me as a perfectly legitimate question, uh, and, and one that still could be studied in randomized trials. Uh, it seems to me you could still evaluate uh, long-term chronic therapy versus alternative long-term chronic therapy, whether it's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or whatever uh, patients are getting in their usual care. So I, I don't think it necessarily calls for a different research paradigm, but uh, would, would require uh, longer and more expensive trials. Can I, can I ask you to comment on, on outcome measures? Uh, how satisfied are you with the Roland Disability Scale, and are there measures that could potentially be incorporated in larger scale studies, such as one might implement in a partnership with a healthcare system? Oh, boy. Uh... Uh, it's a touchy subject, and everybody has their favorite outcome measures, of course. Um, we've been happy with uh, the, our, our measures of pain and function and with the Roland and Morris scale. My sense is that these things are plenty responsive uh, to changes, even relatively small changes that patients have. And the bigger challenge is sort of interpreting what do those small changes really mean. Uh, so we see statistically significant differences. It's easy to get those. Uh, harder, I think, to know whether they're clinically important and actually resulting in important behavior changes uh, on the part of patients. So, so to me, it, it's, it's almost more a question of interpreting the results or, or thinking about outcome measures that are uh, perhaps more rigorous in the sense of uh, truly measuring something that's clearly clinically major uh, as opposed to relatively minor sort of tweaks around the edges. My, my, my hope is that we, we might get there using things that actually combine outcome measures uh, and, and insist not just on a three-point improvement in the Roland scale, but maybe a three-point improvement in the Roland scale and a three-point improvement on the pain scale and some decrease in use of pain medication or some, some measure of that sort uh, that might get us closer to something that is really having an important impact in a patient's life. If, if uh, activity and exercise is, is part of one's promoting greater levels of physical activity is part of one's goal, what about incorporating activ actigraphy or other uh, uh, measures like that? Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm probably not as familiar with, with the latest versions of actigraphy uh, that one might come up with, but, but you're thinking of activity monitors that, yeah. that try to monitor someone's uh, level of physical activity. We, we actually played around with an early version of those uh, early in my career that, that just had a, uh, a mercury switch, basically, that sort of registered changes in position. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the data were so crude and so, so highly variable that, that we really felt we couldn't even analyze them and make much sense of them. Uh, I think modern measures are probably an improvement over that. 
Uh, but I, I guess ultimately I'd want to know, again, how those measures compare with uh, other socially important events uh, like decreased health care utilization or return to work or other uh, things of that sort. Oh, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Dale for a superb presentation.